you. Mr. Bridenstine. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, I appreciate you being here and, and all your great work through the years. Um, in your testimony, you write, uh, or you say and, and write, we recently gained the authority to strike Daesh. Since then, we, would have, we have had considerable success in de degrading their capabilities. Uh, a lot of us were concerned that that authority was not given to you earlier than it was. Uh, and clearly, that has, that has been a, a, a challenge. Um, later in your testimony, you write, groups aligned with the Taliban, such as Al-Qaeda and the Haqqani Network, continue to threaten our national security interests. Can you share for us, um, do you have the authorities necessary to strike the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and the Haqqani Network? Sure, thanks for the question. I have the authority to, to protect uh, the coalition members uh, against any insurgents, Haqqani, Taliban, Al-Qaeda. If, um, if they're posing as a threat uh, to our coalition. But do you have the authority to strike the Taliban because they are the Taliban? Sure, just like, um, again, if the Taliban are attacking coalition forces, then I have everything I need to do that. To attack the Taliban just because they're Taliban, uh, I do not have that authority. So the president, it's, this is uh, the 2001 authorization for use of military force. Quote, the president is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11th, 2001, or harbored such organizations or, per, uh, or persons. Did the Taliban harbor such organizations or persons? The Taliban, Al-Qaeda, um, all of the insurgent groups, the networks that they have are really intertwined. It's very difficult many times to separate who's AQ, who's Taliban, who's TTP, who's IMU, who's LP. So according to the authorization for use of military force, you have the authority given to you by Congress, signed by the president, to use the necessary force, and yet the president, it seems, is saying you can't attack the Taliban even though they were responsible for September 11th? So I think as we adjusted our mission in 2015, um, and we went away from combat operations, and we've worked with the Afghans to uh, build their capability to, to, to go after the Taliban. Again, if the Taliban are, are attacking or pose a threat to coalition forces, I have everything I need to provide that force protection. But so, just to go after Taliban because they're Taliban, uh, I, I don't do that, sir. So when you, when you talk about the train and assist mission, the, the TAA mission, as your testimony uh, talks about, um, the, one of the challenges we have is with only 9,800 troops, makes it difficult to, to do that kind of training and assisting at lower levels. Is that correct? Sir, we only do train, advise, and assist at the ministerial level, MOD, MOI. Uh, at the core level, and really only on four of the six cores. On the other two cores, we provide expeditionary advising. So it's not what we call level one. It's not every day. It's per, uh, sporadically. And then we provide uh, tactical level TAA only with the special operating forces and with the Air Force. So we're not down at the CANDAC or battalion level. We're not down at the brigade level. Would it be beneficial to you to be able to go to those lower levels with training and assisting? So we're, we're looking at in our assessment if that would make a difference. I, I don't think we can do that everywhere. You know, that would, that would, the number of forces that would take would be far more than what we even had in the surge many years ago. I think what we have to do a better job is taking the right units and uh, providing them the right necessary equipment, training, manning, uh, and put them in the right places. And as we focus on the special operating forces, they've made a huge difference. I think if they get after other reforms that we've worked with them on, getting off of checkpoints, you know, coming up with a force generation cycle, working off attrition, building leadership, uh, that will probably do a lot more at this point in time for them than trying to put a whole bunch of people down at the CANDEC level. We, we, that's, that's just unrealistic at this point in time. Uh, the, the limited training and assisting that we're currently doing, uh, we, we ought to be doing more. If we go down from uh, 9,800 troops to 5,500 troops a year from now, I, I presume that means we're going to be doing even less training and, training and equipping. Uh, is that is that going to be a good idea or a bad idea? Given where we are right now, do you think that's even possible? So I'm, I'm working that assessment, work that through the process to provide uh, where we go with that. Again, the, the 5,500 number is more focused on the CT mission. 
as opposed to a TAA mission? So we, will, we won't be able to do TAA at those numbers. So we'll have a very limited ability to do TAA with 5,500 them. Lastly, Mr. Chairman, uh, it is astonishing that, um, that, that we have an authority to go after the Taliban and the President is preventing us from doing that. Uh, I yield back. Mr. Ashford. Yeah, thank you, General Campbell. And I, I, I was in uh, Afghanistan last February, so a year ago. And I, I would just chime in by saying that I think that that what I've been hearing today and have read is that the, that there have been exceptional things happen in the last year, and that. Um, uh, it's interesting when we met with uh, General Ghani, or I'm sorry, uh, President Ghani back in February, and we talked about the many elements of what has to change in Afghanistan to be successful. And obviously, there's the military side, uh, but there are other elements that are uh, critical. And I, I was struck by what you've said today and about your uh, uh, involvement in those other elements of how do you create a stable uh, country. And I think back to my, even in, in Omaha, University of Nebraska at Omaha, where Tom Gutierrez uh, at the Afghan Studies Program at UNO has been there for 45 years working with, uh, in fact, President Ghani mentioned when we first met him uh, that uh, he had known uh, Tom Gutierrez, Dr. Gutierrez, since he was 17 years old. So there's been this incredible commitment by the military, obviously, and yourself and your team and lots of other people who are, have made this commitment. Here, here's my, my question, really, and you've probably answered most of it, but number one is there's a big difference in my mind between a sunset saying, well, we're going to be gone in a year, or we're going to go to some number in a year, and what you're ta talking about today, which is a five-year vision. Um, to me, hearing you talk about a five-year vision is a very refreshing thing. We were just in uh, at NATO uh, on our way back from the Gulf states and uh, talking about the Warsaw Conference and uh, the need for a, a five-year vision in Afghanistan. What, what, in your view, would be those elements, many of which you've already talked about and worked on, that would be in a five-year vision? Um, what, what would you see a five-year vision entailing in an optimum sense? So again, you know, I talk usually just from the security perspective, and then we would work uh, on different areas on the Afghan security forces to build upon the areas that we knew they would have issues with that would take years to build on, intelligence, close air support, th th those kinds of things we've talked about in the past. But I, th I think a five-year vision really from, from NATO, the U.S., everybody working together is not just the security piece. It involves the political dimension and economic dimension. Uh, and I think uh, NATO is behind that. I believe we're working toward that as well. Uh, President Ghani wants to continue to push that. So, um, you know, President Ghani, uh, Dr. Abdullah, President Obama uh, do periodic video teleconferences. I've been honored to have the opportunity to sit in those with, with the President. Uh, he's done several of those in the last 18 months. They continue to talk through what they need to do as they go forward. I think those have been very helpful. And, uh, you know, with President Ghani, you, you have a commander in chief, and a lot of things that he does, again, different from previous folks that were there. Uh, is try to model a lot what he's done, learned on based on, you know, um, what he sees from the United States. He considers us a foundational partner, and I think we've got to continue to provide uh, the ability to stay with him. And he understands that he's not going to try to do anything uh, that would get in the way to do that. He, he's, he is getting after all the things we want him to get after, corruption, uh, working gender integration issues, uh, building civilian leadership, building military leadership. So I, I think all of those would go inside of a, uh, the, uh, the plan as we go forward. And I think it's exceptional what you've been able to accomplish, General, quite frankly, because those are the elements that we talked about a year ago. And, and there certainly are challenges with, with, with Dash and others, uh, other elements here. But every one of those elements uh, were challenges and uh, that, that President Ghani talked to us about. And you've been able, working with him, uh, and your team working with his team to advance the ball quite a bit, in my view. I mean, we, all I can do is look at what I saw then when President Ghani first got there and now. And, yeah, there are challenges, clearly, obviously, but there are significant strides that have been made. And I, going down the checklist and, and even expanding it beyond that, just, you know, issues involving, I know President Ghani talked about attitudes towards women. Uh, and, um, uh, you, you know, I, I think that's clearly been an issue for him. And all these things that, that were on the table needed to be addressed um, one year ago uh, are being addressed uh, in a very positive fashion. So thank you. Sir, I've had a lot of help. It's, it's not about me here. Thanks, sir. I yield back. Thanks, Mr. Chairman.
Ms. Stefanik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General Campbell. It's great to see you again. I had the opportunity to visit with you in November on a congressional delegation. I was able to visit with soldiers that I represent uh, in the 10th Mountain Division at Fort Drum. I wanted to talk to you about, uh, in your testimony today, you discussed the fact that terrorist organizations are no longer siloed, that it's much more of a terrorist network. To what extent is ISKP recruiting current and former members of the Taliban? In your testimony last, uh, a couple months ago, you assessed that ISKP was evolving from nascent to operationally emergent. How would you describe that progress today, and how does that impact the security conditions on the ground? Ma'am, thanks for the visit. Thanks for the great 10th Mountain Division uh, that continues to remain there today. Um, you know, Daesh, um, ISKP continues to recruit and really started from in Afghanistan disenfranchised members of the TTP or the Pakistani Taliban. That was really the core and the senior leadership of ISKP continues to come from uh, TTP. They have gained um, other members of the Taliban that may have become, um, that see the success that happened in Syria and Iraq. They see more money, so they want to join something like that. They've been able to use that to the benefit using uh, social media to recruit. President Ghani, I said in the past, talked about uh, Al-Qaeda being Windows 1.0 and Daesh being you know, Windows 7.0 when it comes to social recruiting. Um, it has made a difference on the battlefield. They've continued to grow. February, March time frame, I did say nascent. Uh, Operation Emergent is what I said back in October. They continue to be about the same place. I don't think they have the ability today to attack Europe, to attack the homeland. I think if left unchecked, they would have that ability. They have expressed that they want to attack Americans, that they want to attack the homeland. And so everything that we can do to, to make sure they can't do that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get after that. The ability to, to go after ISIL, as we've done in the last week and a half or so, I think has made a, uh, a significant impact on their leadership and on um, their ability to continue to form in Nangahar, particularly Achin and Daybala districts of Nangahar, um, and we'll continue to work that piece of it. The Taliban and, the, and Daesh fight each other or have fought each other. It has caused the Taliban to move resources, as I mentioned in the opening statement, away from other areas to fight ISIL and Nangahar, and that has an impact on the battlefield. But you know, they, let's make no doubt about it. They have expressed desire to attack the United States, to kill Americans, to attack Europe. Uh, they want to do what's happened in Syria and Iraq and gain ground in Afghanistan. They want to take over Jalalabad, build in the Kunar province to establish the, the Khorasan province, which is Afghanistan, part of Pakistan, Central South Asia. So um, there's no doubt they want to do that, and they're going to continue to work toward that. It is very hard, I think, as we move forward um, to see the difference between the networks out there of all the terrorists. Uh, many of them provide different types of support uh, to each other uh, in many of the ungoverned areas, both in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. And I think Pakistan has done a lot of stuff in the last year very courageously from General Raheel, the Chief of the Army, to, to have pac mill operations in Pakistan. Uh, but the result of that has driven a lot of that into Afghanistan, and the Afghan forces have had to deal with that as well. So. You know, we'll, we'll continue to say after this, but ISIL, you know, we have to continue, or, or I, ISKP, DICE, we have to continue to keep pressure on, or it will, it will, it will grow to where we do not want it to be. Thank you for that uh, answer. I want to shift gears here to you noted three capabilities, logistics, intelligence, and close air support uh, that the Afghan security forces need to further develop. Can you specifically uh, discuss metrics in 2016 that you were looking for to see improvements? Um, you know, what specifically are you looking for in those three capabilities areas? Yeah, simple things like in the logistics realm, you know, they have, every day the Afghans ask me for more of this, more of that, certain leadership down at uh, lower levels, and they have, they have the equipment, they have the ammunition, it's a matter of leadership, it's a matter of supply distribution, so we're taking a holistic look at their entire supply system on how we can make it easier for them uh, to be able to provide the right uh, logistics support for all of their forces. You know, we, sometimes what we do is we go into a place and we make it too hard. We impose our systems and processes, and we find out that, you know, they're just not capable of having that same type of system, so we have to adjust. Not everybody in Afghanistan can read or write. Not everybody in Afghanistan has the ability to get on a computer and have all their logistic supplies uh, and move of their logistic supplies based on uh, 
the network that we have that we have here in the United States. So we have to adjust. And, and what I tell our advisors all the time is keep it simple. You know, do everything we can to keep it simple. So in many areas that we thought we were doing a good job, we have to go back and ask ourselves, you know, was that the right way to do it? Logistics is a hard area, but I think simple things like taking logistics from point A, getting it to point B, getting it to the people on the ground is a pretty simplistic measure, but that, that's what we're looking at. And close air support, it's really about gaining the ability to fly uh, both day and night. We've got to continue to work. 2016 is, a, is a, getting them to fly at night is going to be very, very important as, as we go forward. In the intelligence place, I think, in, in the intelligence arena, uh, having them continue to build upon MOD, MOI, NDS, their intel agency, working together to take a look from the strategic level all the way down to the tactical level, I think will make a big difference. They've, they've formed a fusion cell uh, earlier this year that they've never had intel fusion cell at the strategic level, and that's starting to make a difference now as it takes strategic intelligence from all the different agencies and pumps that out to the special operating forces so they can prosecute a target, and that's making a difference. I'm over my time. I yield back. Mr. Moulton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, first, I just want to join Mr. Gibson and so many others who have thanked you for your service. Uh, there are very few people who have to make daily life and death decisions and are fundamentally, in a very direct way, responsible uh, for the survival and success of our nation's most precious assets, the young Americans who fight on the front lines. Certainly none of us on this side of the room have that direct responsibility that you do, and I can say that you will be missed. I want to go back to a comment you made about making sure that uh, 2016 is not a rerun of 2015. My personal concern is that, uh, even, even more broadly, that uh, 2016 or 2017 or 2018 becomes a rerun of the 2010 to 2013 period we saw in Iraq, where things really fell apart. And I, and I think of that game that you sometimes see in, in bars where there's the, it's called Jenga, and there's a pile of sticks. And what happened in Iraq is we had this nice pile that we had constructed at the cost of a lot of time and a lot of American lives. And then the enemies of Iraq and America were steadily pulling out one stick at a time. And we were standing far enough back that we could still say, look, it looks like a great tower. In fact, it's even getting a little bit higher as they pull a stick out and put it back on top. But at some point, the whole thing collapsed. And my concern is that there's a lot of evidence out there, despite the, the uh, admirable progress that you have made, that things in Afghanistan aren't getting better. In fact, they might be getting a little bit worse. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned that the, now, the, the differences that you describe between Iraq and Afghanistan aren't really so stark. Uh, there are an awful lot of Iraqi leaders who wanted us to stay in the country. There was just one guy at the top who did not. That's a very analogous situation to the, the problem we have with Karzai, and if President Ghani is not there in the future, we could see that problem again. Uh, there, are a lot of, there is a lot of sectarianism in Iraq. I also know new army units that were very non-sectarian and were very committed to the national unity government. There are also stories, uh, tremendous stories, of Iraqi army success uh, despite the well-publicized failures, and indeed the same is true in Afghanistan. But what happened in Iraq is not that the uh, that they, Daesh came in and just overran the Iraqi army. The Iraqi army put their weapons down and went home because they had lost faith in their government, because when they looked at that tower, it had collapsed. Now, you mentioned in Afghanistan today that it's not just our troops on the front lines, but these advisors in the ministries, the people who were working on Afghan governance, to make sure that that doesn't happen in Afghanistan. But if you look at uh, our, the progress with the Afghan government, we've gone from approval ratings in the 70s to a uh, recent survey, survey that had approval ratings in the 6 to 8 percent range. So I'm very concerned that we're going to see a repeat of Iraq 2010 to 2013 in Afghanistan over the next three years. So what do we need to do differently? If you came and testified to us that everything was just fine and maintain, we were maintaining the status quo, that it seems like a good response to that would be to keep our forces at the same level. And yet the two choices on the table are keeping them at the same level or reducing them when it seems like in many measures, in many ways, things are actually getting worse. So what do you think that we need to do differently so that we can make positive forward progress, not just on the military front, but on the political front with the Afghan government so that we don't see things sliding back, more sticks being pulled out, and someday we just see the tower collapse? 
Sure, thanks for the question. Um, again, I, I spent a lot of time with President Ghani, Dr. Abdullah, um, as does Ambassador McKinley uh, from the embassy. Uh, we have a great partnership together. Uh, I'm honored to work with him. I know that uh, he and I have spent a lot of time together uh, going after the exact question you talked about, talking to President Ghani about um, things that he could do to help manage better inside the government, working with Dr. Abdullah. You know, they both um, understand how important it is to keep the national union government together. I do believe uh, that they both want to continue to keep the national government together, despite all the other distractors around them, despite the, the you know, the lack of a better term, the opposition groups that are starting to form that want to want to take away uh, President Ghani or take away Dr. Dula. And a lot of that, quite frankly, is is so politically based on constituencies and because certain groups haven't uh, been given a ministerial job or a governorship or something like that. General, I'm almost all out of time, but if you could continue on, on the record for what we in the United States could be doing differently to improve the situation, to make sure that the progress we make is greater than the progress we've seen over the past year, uh, I, I would very much appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Dr. Winstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, thank you. I'll echo what the others have said. I thank you for your service. I don't know that uh, most people in the country truly understand um, what you have done and what many others like you ha have done to serve this country, and, it, and it's appreciated. You, you mentioned in here that we re you recently gained the authority to strike at, at uh, Dash. What were you doing before that when, when they were on the move or a threat? How did you handle that? So if they were a threat and we knew they were a threat to attacking coalition, then I would have the ability to provide that force protection. I would strike them. But only in a defensive posture or? or, or only if I knew they were going to attack coalition, okay. yes, sir. Um, you mentioned the capability gap that exists today, uh, that, uh, the, the deficiencies that you see that where they need our help. And what do you see as a time frame for those capabilities being fulfilled I mean, are we talking 20 years, which, you know, you mentioned 240 years for us and eight years for them is a big difference, right? So uh, do you see them trending towards that and having that capability, those capabilities someday? So I think every, every area is different, but I'll take aviation because it's, it's uh, easy to look at, I think. It's going to take, you know, we won't even get the last uh, aircraft that, that we're working toward to probably 2018 timeframe. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're talking two, three more years just to get... Uh, that aircraft, and in that time frame, many of the aircraft could could be have issues with maintenance, could have battle damage, on and on and on. But the human capital of building their pilots for years and years, you know, you got to start that now and make sure they realize if you recruit a guy now, you're not going to see him for another three years before he can be a, a pilot. So aviation is an area that's going to take a long time, uh, several years, to get them to where uh, they were used to. You know, when, when we went out as a as a force. We showed them we would never go out unless we had ISR, unless we had uh, attack helicopters, all the enablers out there. Yet, as they took over the country, they didn't have all of those enablers, all of that support. So we're, we're working through that to build that support for them. Uh, but again, the Taliban doesn't have a lot of that either, and we've got to make sure that they don't look at the Taliban as, as 10 feet tall, as I talked about in the opening statement. So is that the capability that you think will take the longest, is aviation? I, I think aviation is probably the area that will take the longest, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. O'Rourke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, thank you for your testimony, for your service, and for hosting so many of us who have uh, visited you and the service members who serve under you in, in Afghanistan. Um, the, the primary goal, as I understand it, in terms of our efforts in Afghanistan is to prevent that country from ever again becoming a place from which terrorists or those who would do us harm could launch attacks against the United States. That makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, and again, I thank you and those who serve under you for your success uh, to date. The, the secondary goals are harder for me to, to follow. Uh, you mentioned in kind of a negative way what one of the goals is not. It is not to perpetuate a, a stalemate. You don't want to see that continue. Uh, and yet I am unclear uh, at this point as to what we will do to prevent that from happening, this, this uh, indefinite stalemate, and 
what we are willing to do to help the Afghanistan national government should it fail to prevail against the Taliban. Um, my understanding is we are not at war today with the Taliban. Uh, and my understanding is that uh, we have a train, advise, and assist function. We don't have an active combat function uh, against the Taliban. Um, you've made a great case as to why uh, we might want to understand the Afghan National Army's performance in the perspective of only having been stood up for the last seven years and that there will need to be some ongoing U.S. commitment. Do you have any thoughts about what we as policymakers should be willing to commit to should the Afghan National Army not succeed in holding back Taliban advances, whether they are in Kandahar, Kunduz, uh, or elsewhere in the country? Sure, you're absolutely right on, you know, we have, I have two sort of narrow mission sets, counterterrorism under my, my U.S. hat and the train advise and assist under my U.S. and my, and my NATO hat. And I do believe that we have to continue to build upon the Afghan uh, capabilities to get after CT, which they want to do. And the train advise and assist is a very important piece to build their, their, their capability. Um, I think as we go forward, what Congress can do is what you have done for the last 14, 15 years is continue to support the campaign by approving the money, by approving the ability to bring our great men and women over to Afghanistan, by providing the equipment, by providing, um, you know, the support that way. That, that's made a huge difference, and we've always had that continued support. And uh, we should let that go uh, unnoticed. But, but I do think that, um, you know, I, I go back to this as a generational struggle. And too many times we think that we can get this done very, very quickly. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you, and, and, and most of your military commanders would tell you, that we have to have some strategic patience. And we have to have the ability to always assess where we're going. And, you know, in the military we do lessons learned all the time and, and try to learn, learn from those. And, and I've done that based on really the last fighting season. And I think there's some adjustments we have to make sure that we propose to, that I have proposed to the senior leadership that will move forward and then make some decisions. And I think for continued modest investment in Afghanistan, the second and third order impact of not having another 9-11 is, is a pretty big deal or to be able to provide the Afghan force to continue to grow. Yes, sir. I think we're in a tough place. Uh, when, I know someone else asked about conditionality, about setting benchmarks that the Afghanistan national government has to meet in order for us to continue or increase support because of that primary mission. We'll, we'll, we will never allow Afghanistan again uh, to become the launching pad for attacks against the United States. They know, the Afghanistan national government uh, knows that. So it's, it's very hard for us to follow through uh, on that, you know, implied threat that if you do not do the following things, uh, leading in the fight, reforming in, in your government, uh, we will not be there for you. We are going to be there uh, to ensure that we do not have that, that threat again. Um, so my, my question really goes back to what should we as policymakers, what should the American public to set our expectations be ready to do if the modest changes, perhaps some modest increases in funding don't get the job done and we see a, another significant city fall even temporarily to the Taliban or for a longer period of time, should we be thinking about um, potentially going to war again against the Taliban, or is there some other strategy if the current status quo with some refinement doesn't work? I realize I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman, so I may have to take that for the record. Sure, I'll take indulgence. it for the record, but you know, one, one thing I talked about up front is you know, we're not going to kill our way out of this. There has to be some, for, some form of political settlement reconciliation. The Afghans want to go that way. President Ghani is leading that effort. And I think, uh, you know, all the countries around, I talked about Pakistan, China, the United States supporting that effort. Uh, and that is a way that we have to continue to move forward. Thanks. Ms. McSally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to echo uh, what many of my colleagues have said, and thank you so much for your service. It was also great to visit you uh, back in May, uh, see the incredible leadership that you're providing, and, and you definitely will be missed. Um, as we talk about the strategy uh, that we've had for maybe the last several years of, you know, ramping up ANSF capability and ramping down our capability, it seems that's happened on the ground, but you've clearly stated, and it's very obvious that that didn't happen with the air capabilities. So for whatever reason, uh, decisions were made that uh, we were basically going to pull back on our air power capabilities to include those you mentioned, whether that's airstrikes and using air power. Uh, 
uh, on its own or close air support and ISR before they had the capability ramped up. And that's creating the huge gap that you mentioned in your testimony today. So I know you're not in a position to decide on that, but let's just imagine, you know, should a decision be changed that we would again provide American or coalition NATO air power for airstrikes against the enemy, uh, which you've uh, laid out, the networks of the enemy, and close air support to uh, our supporting uh, coalition partners on the ground, like we did after 9-11 uh, and like we're doing in other places in the world, what would that do to change the dynamics, to create the space so there could be a political solution and the ANSF could continue to grow their capability? Ma'am, great question. And, you know, I think what we're trying to do is mitigate on the ground how we can work, work toward that by providing them other ways to get after that same um, problem set. So, but let's say tomorrow we gave you a couple more squadrons, a, a strike aircraft, and the authorities to be able to actually strike, provide close air support, ISR. Like, just what would that, what would that do? I think what you meant is A-10s, that you would give me 24 As, Of course. Yes, ma'am. Um, <laughs> You know, we'd have to really work through TTPs to make yeah. sure that we can, as you know, it's very hard unless you have people on the ground right. to be able to provide precise uh, direction to hit that target you're going to hit. So we'd have to really work through the, the techniques, tactics, and procedures that we would use. And sometimes, in some cases, that may take more resources of people. Right. In some areas, as you train the Afghans to be able to do that to interact, uh, you, could, you could reduce that threat. So, I mean, we're looking hard at that. We do continue to provide train, advise, and assist at the tactical level with the special operating forces. We're trying to build, and we are building their JTAC capability on the special operations side. We are trying to build their JTAC capability on the conventional side as well, not only to interact with uh, their close air support platforms, but if, if needed to understand other nations that could provide support. Great, thanks. Forward. You know, similarly, you talked about the, uh, the network of the different terrorist organizations and how they're intertwined. Uh, and the challenges with authority. So again, let's just say tomorrow there was a decision that you now have the authority. Uh, we still have the PID and the CDE requirements, but you had the authority to strike any of those networks, assuming you met those other criteria. What would that do to change the situation on the ground and strategically? Yeah, I, I would have to make that call based on resources, you know, based on a particular target as we go forward. Uh, we, were, we were able to get the ISIL, DICE authority, and not take any more resources, but at the same time continue to, to degrade that, that network. We'd have to take a hard look on how we would do that to other networks if, if we had a change in authority. So, again, some, some we would have to probably ask for additional resources, in other areas we would not. The one resource that I didn't bring up in another question asked earlier is ISR. You know, every mm -hmm. combatant commander, every commander on the ground mm -hmm. has an insatiable appetite for ISR. And uh, we have the same thing in Afghanistan. And we are building the Afghan capability this year to have their own full motion video uh, in a scan eagle uh, right. uh, ISR platform, so that, that's going to be really good as they get that. Okay, great. Uh, last question is, we're, you know, we're at 9,800 right now. Again, it's just been directed uh, with the direction to from the administration to ramp down to 5,500 for 2017, but it's also supposed to be conditions based, uh, and we also have an election going on. We're going to have a new commander in chief uh, in January. Uh, just picturing trying to redeploy squadrons that potentially with a new commander in chief, there could be a change in that direction. We could be ramping up and additional resources in order to uh, address the, you know, strategic long haul that we need to have there. Uh, imagining the, the sort of uh, short-term redeployment and then deployment back again, wouldn't it make more sense uh, to just kind of stabilize where we are and let the next Commander-in-Chief uh, make their assessments as opposed to ramping down and then potentially a change in direction, just from an efficiencies point of view of the, the uh, units that would be involved in redeployments? If there was a decision to go from 5,500 back up to whatever number uh, next year sometime, absolutely. If you're already on the ground, you, you have the equipment. I think that the decision in October of this past year that President Obama made, again, I talked in terms of uh, not necessarily the numbers but the capabilities, but what more uh, that I welcomed there was the, the bases. So Bagram, Jalalabad, Kandahar, it gave us the opportunity to provide flexibility and options for future leadership. Great. Thanks. Thanks for your service again, and uh, I yield back. Mr. Vesey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Campbell, I wanted to ask you specifically about the, um, about the ANA Trust Fund. And how far into the future do you see the U.S. investing uh, in the Trust Fund and, 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 to, and, and to what level? I wanted to ask you, like, is it, do, you, do you see it uh, gradually uh, going down over a certain amount of time? Or do you think that as far as us being committed to this fight to make sure that that we have that we have some sort of stability in in, uh, in Afghanistan that there be a certain level of 
of stability in the funding? So I think for all of the different funding streams that come into Afghanistan, whether it's a uh, antitrust fund, LAFTA, uh, pure U.S. money that we provide, that all of those we're looking to bring them down over time as we get more affordable. We have to make the Afghan security forces more affordable, more efficient, and more sustainable. And we continue to look at ways we can do that. So I see all the money sources coming in, all the donor nations continue to want to try to bring that down. But I think over time, at least uh, 2017, 18, 19, and 20, as we, as we move toward Warsaw, we want to keep it at the, the funding levels that we're about right now. And uh, my last question that I wanted to ask you was about the drawdown. Uh, as it was stated uh, earlier by my colleague, that we're, the drawdown by the end of uh, 2016 will go to about 5,500 military personnel. And I wanted to ask you about the placement. Do you still anticipate placing a presence in the south and east of Afghanistan? So currently we have uh, forces in the east and the south, and under the 5,500 we'll continue to have forces in the east and south. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And General Campbell, thanks for your decades of defense to our republic and doing the hardest things that our nation asks. And also, thank you for your perseverance when we inadvertently obstructed. I'd like to give a quote uh, from some opponents of the American efforts in the war. We have got into a mess, a quagmire from which each step renders the difficulty of extraction immediately greater. I'm sure I wish I could see what we were getting out of it. The quote was from 1900, October 6th. American efforts in the Philippines, 14 years, 4,500 dead, 20,000 wounded. This body repeatedly asked military leaders, why are we there? What are we doing? What is the point? And yet, at the end of that, another three decades of commitment where we were willing to build their infrastructure, help their people, grant them the means to have independence. And although the 1944 date of complete independence was interrupted by World War II, it was restored two years after the end of the war, they became a crucial ally that became a vital strategic projection platform in all of our efforts in the Pacific. And today they're a top 50 economy that provides much of our clothing and furniture in the United States. Hard to see, hard for these opposers to see that, and yet it was the commitment of American service personnel that made it happen. I sit here somewhat amused as a veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan, listening to much of the discussion, the debate about Afghan security forces and their ability to control most of the nation. Uh, my efforts with the Afghan security forces was zero. When we worked with two para uh, and third special forces in the spring of 2002 to create a vision and an effort that would get us there uh, from being a delegate at an Afghan uh, security conference and getting commitments from partner nations around the world so that we could see this day where we were having debates about, well, they don't use communication very well and they don't have their logistics down. What a great problem to have. And thank you, sir, for your efforts in continuing that and making so much of that happen. My colleagues ask questions about the expense of it. And yet, I ask the question, how much is a failed state worth? Section 60 in Arlington, where many of my friends are buried, and yours. And what about their commitment, not their politics? Abandonment in Iraq was far more costly than had we remained committed there. We created a situation where, where we failed to lead. Tyrants and regional destabilizers filled the void. Millions have been displaced. ISIS has ascended. And human suffering on a barbaric scale has been reintroduced to mankind. And so I guess my question to you would be 25 years from now, what would, in your estimation, Afghanistan and the region look like with our partnership? And what would it look like with our abandonment? So I think with our continued partnership and long-term commitment 25 years from now, you know, I can take my family to Afghanistan and visit 
all those places that some of the members had talked about that were that they'd like to go see Bami and, and the mountains of the Hindu Kush and on and on that they'd have a government that is for the people uh, they'd have the Afghan people working uh, all the women and children that wanted to go all the uh, boys and girls that wanted to go to school could go to school on and on they have that same vision that everybody here in the US wants for their for their men and women and that will happen if we have a long-term commitment commitment as you talked about and if we we don't continue to provide the space and time for them to grow that ability to sustain uh, both their economy and their national security, uh, they won't get to that. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm personally invested in Afghanistan. My family is, the men and women I've been surrounded with the last 14 years. And, and I do think, you know, we got to talk in uh, our definition of time, their definition of time are two different things, as, as you pointed out. And we got we to stay for the long haul here. Thank you, General Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Ms. Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, General. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't had as long of an opportunity to work with you, but I've heard such amazing things about your service, so I want to add to that chorus. Um, my question sort of is a natural segue. Uh, there was an article in the Washington, from your last um, answer, there was an article in the Washington Post today that talks about the deteriorating humanitarian conditions in Iraq. Um, and we also found, find, often find that when the people are struggling, uh, it, it increases the radicalism in a country. So I'm wondering, what, um, what do you see on the ground in terms of the humanitarian condition of the people in Afghanistan? Ma'am, again, I think, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, what, what the people of Afghanistan want is, is governance for the district level. It's very, very tough for them to do that in many of the remote areas. They expect that the national union government will provide that. They're working very hard to put into place the right leadership at the district level, the right members of parliament to work, work through that. I think they're all concerned with uh, the humanitarian aspects of that. Uh, all of the ambassadors from all the different countries get together periodically to talk with the Afghan leadership on ways that they can move forward on getting after humanitarian issues there. So I, I think there is good dialogue and you have to be talking about that as, as you move forward. And so I see continued progress, although slow, but I think as we continue to uh, talk and make the Afghans aware of uh, the issues that are out there, they want to try to make changes to build upon uh, those efforts. So uh, I, think, I think we'll continue to see growth in that area. I often talk about this because I think this really is key to moving towards a place of peace across our world, which is getting to the youth. Um, uh, across our world uh, about wanting peace and, and wanting to find a way where we can, I know, uh, you know, find a way to stop all of these wars and conflicts. What do you see with the youth in, um, in Afghanistan? And is there a social media presence in, in Afghanistan? And are we doing any soft power um, programs to try to encourage um, the youth uh, for a brighter future? Yes, ma'am, thank you for the question. I think, I think the future of Afghanistan and the hope of Afghanistan is the youth of the country. Uh, I meet periodically, tri-monthly with an Afghan advisory board. I bring in different um, segments of the society, uh, both uh, male and female, um, publicists, economists, uh, members of parliament, on and on. And most of them are, are younger. And um, I could go into that meeting very frustrated on other things that have happened throughout uh, my day earlier. When I come out of that meeting, I'm, I'm always inspired because of the young people. Uh, you know, they, they understand the problems, and they've only known, you know, for the last 37, 38 years, war. And so they want to have a better life. They, they do have the ability, because of the freedom of the press, which is getting attacked by the Taliban, which happened last week, but they do have the ability to see TV, to listen to radio. They do have Facebook and Twitter and all those kind of things in more of the built-up areas as opposed to out in the, the rural areas. But they see that there are other things out there, and they want to have the ability to have those opportunities as well. So I, I think the youth, based on the number that want to go to school, the, the number that uh, want to better their lives, I, I think that's the future. And I see that in the Army and the police as well with the young captains and majors and sergeants that have come back to the United States for training and now go back and bring that, that uh, education back with them. We have to continue to get them in the right places of leadership so we can build upon you know, what they've learned, and, and they seek that out. 
Well, I see the same thing here in this country. It's the youth that gives me such hope and optimism about our future. So it's good to know that the Afghanistan youth and the American youth share uh, that in common. Uh, I don't know if it's possible. Do we have a program where the American youth are reaching out to Afghanistan youth and back and forth uh, so they can build those friendships and relationships and trust and caring uh, where, where there's a desire to stop, you know, the mutual desire to stop the wars? Um, and, and have a better future for us all. Ma'am, I know there's a lot of different organizations from a lot of countries and the U.S. included that reach out to Afghanistan and particularly focus on the youth. I can come back to you with a better answer and, and give you some of those organizations. I saw in the audience, you may have left Bonnie Carroll here that uh, you know, runs TAPS, Tragedy Assistance Program here in the United States. I saw her in Afghanistan here a couple weeks ago that's reaching out to the orphans and the children of the, of the martyrs or the folks that have been killed or wounded in Afghanistan. And, you know, Bonnie's done incredible work for all of our services. Thank you, Bonnie. And, and she's taken that to Afghanistan now. Just gave me goosebumps to say that there. It, it gave me goosebumps, too. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, General. I yield back. Ms. Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General, thank you for being here today. Um, in the Pentagon's Enhancing Security and Stability in Afghanistan report, it says that um, given the ANDSF's current stage of development, they can't manage the insurgency and ensure security and stability across Afghanistan without further improvements in key enabling capabilities. During your October 2015 testimony, you were very harsh on the capacity and readiness of the ANDSF's conventional units, and, and you and I actually talked briefly about some of the root causes of their ineffectiveness. As you recall, um, you cited a lack of tactical level train advise and assist TAA mentors. Um, as one reason for their failures. And you contrasted that with what the Afghan Special Forces had, um, who do have advisors down at the tactical level. Now, we've been deployed to Afghanistan for a long time, and there's really almost no end in sight. And ideally, we could just bring everyone home, but reading the latest security assessments, I know that's not a reality. However, I do want to have an honest conversation about the exact level of commitment that we're talking about. I want to know the full extent of what it would take to conduct a proper TAA mission so that the ANDSF can get on the right trajectory and more importantly, so the American people have a clear understanding of what we're doing here and how many troops it will take. Given the current troop levels, are we able to effectively align our advisors at the appropriate echelons within the ANDSF to where we would see a difference in their capability? And how many troops would be required in order to better align our advisors with um, the NDSF to where they would be most impactful, where we could actually start to see more long-term positive trends. Thank you for the question, ma'am. And again, um, two mission sets that I focus on, train, advise, and assist uh, at the ministry, at the core level, and tactical at the Special Operating Forces, and then the, the counterterrorism mission under U.S. hat uh, to build their capacity. And I think each one of those, you've got to kind of break those out in bins as you, as you work, work toward that. And we made the decision uh, a while back to continue to build our capability, but at the same time have a glide slope to bring our forces off as we raise our capability. And in some instances, it depends upon the unit that, that has had uh, uh, that level of training and the right leadership that's put in place to be able to have that training sustained and move out. There are places in Afghanistan uh, like the 203rd Corps, where we came off of at the core level and through the fighting season 15, they continued to do pretty good. And uh, I would only put expeditionary advising down there very sporadically, and they continue to operate. There are places like Hellman with a 215th where we didn't have advisors at the core level, and uh, they didn't do as well. And I've had to move more advisors down there now to build that capacity up to get ready for the next next fighting season. So some of it is really, for me, goes back to leadership and have the right leadership in place as opposed to, uh, you know, the numbers of advisors, because we see it differently uh, throughout the country of Afghanistan. But where they do have the right leadership and we do focus and build on those capabilities, you know, they continue to get better and better. Uh, you know, I think uh, I have to be realistic in, in understanding the different resources out there and what, what we need uh, throughout not only Afghanistan, but in Europe, in Africa, the Pacific, and there is a limited number and finite number of resources. I fight every day to have ISR, and I work very, and, and I'm very fortunate to have General Austin at CENTCOM work with me on ISR as he continues to have the fight against ISIL in Iraq and Syria, and I have that fight in Afghanistan. I work with him 
to make sure we have the right resources, and he's, he's given me everything that I've asked for. But I know that for him, it is a continual struggle because he has uh, a limited number of resources. So I, I take that into consideration as, as we look forward in Afghanistan. And I think, again, we're, we're doing assessment now. I've made an assessment on things that we could do in 16 to make a difference so it's not like 15. And uh, realistically, the, the thing that I can make a difference on is authorities as we go forward. And that's in the process now of, of working some of those. And then in 17, we've already committed to keeping, again, as I said in my opening statement, you know, 18 months ago, we were going to be at 1,000 only in Kabul. Now we're 5,500 in many places, yet we're still talking about we need more and more. So I have to take a look at what we do have and where we're going to make the big, biggest bang for buck for the resources we have. And I'll provide all of that uh, to my leadership as we, as we go forward. But I think, it, it, you know, every commander has a continual assessment as we go down. And it's not a simple, you know, I need X amount of people. You can have the forces, but if you don't have the authorities, it doesn't make a difference. You can have the authorities, but if you don't have the resources mm -hmm. to execute at those authorities, uh, it doesn't make a difference. So you have to have that balance as you move forward. Well, th that's exactly what I wanted to touch on, which is, you know, um, given, uh, uh, you know, as you're trying to push some more units to the lower echelons, what do you see as assuming risk, giving flat or even declining troop authorization levels? And, and how do we mitigate that risk? And, and what criteria must exist for you to recommend an increase in number of U.S. Um, uh, or NATO forces in Afghanistan? And I can take your answer. Um, I know I'm over time, Mr. Chairman. I'm, uh, on I'll record. provide that to you. Thank you. Record. Thank you. General, one brief clarifying question. If your successor, if nothing changes and your successor has to be at 5,500 by January 1st, 2017, at what rough time frame do things have to move? Uh, do, do decisions have to be made uh, to get to that level? Sir, my, my leadership has left it up to me, and, and uh, General Nicholson will have the ability to, to, to take a look at what I've recommended as we go from the 9,800 to the 5,500. Obviously, we'd like to continue to keep the highest number during uh, increased fighting in the summer and then hold those forces and then decrease after that. Uh, so, you know, after the September, October time frame, you'd have a short window of opportunity to bring that down. At some point, as I've talked before, it becomes a matter of physics on how you can move people in or out. And, and, but again, we, we can do that, I think, very quickly. We've been, we've been doing that for years. Our logisticians are the best in the world and very confident uh, we'll make those decisions. But, but as, as I talked about, sir, continual investment, I have to go back to leadership and say, you know, based on the Afghans and what they have done, um, based on where we want to go, take a look at the risk of the force and the risk of the mission, and here's some changes that we ought to make. And, and I think uh, we're doing that now, and I'll make sure that General Nicholson uh, has the ability. On the NATO piece, we're trying to work that very quickly. If NATO is going to make a determination to change numbers, advisors, enablers, we're working that through their process, and we'll try to make those decisions before the summer that would enable 2017 just based on a force generation cycle that they have. Okay. Well, um, after two and a half hours, I think uh, that uh, there's a lot of consensus in this room, a, a lot of consensus uh, of respect and gratitude for you and your family. Um, a recognition that a lot of pro the Afghans have made a lot of progress with our help and, and also a sense of unease about what the future holds depending on the decisions that, uh, that are made there. Um, but uh, as, as I said at the beginning, there's, uh, I, I feel in a lot of ways you've been walking a tightrope and even in that difficult situation uh, have done an extraordinary job in making sure that our security interests in Afghanistan have been protected. So thank you for today, and thank you for your service, and we all wish you the best. With that, the hearing stands adjourned.